Coming at you from beautiful BC, this is Left of Valley 2.0. My name is Kevin, and the doctor told me that I should touch myself whenever I want. But actually, yes, she said I could have a stroke any time. <laughs> Join me today. God, is... that's so bad. <laughs> Join me today is my co-host, Cosmic Kyle. Kyle, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing pretty good. How are you doing, Kevin? It's always, it's always a pleasure. Kyle, uh, you know what? We have a very special guest on today. I really appreciate you joining me. But uh, also, we have Dave Warnock with us. Who, you know, when you think courage, you think of the Dave Warnock story. Dave, thank you so much for being on Left of the Night 2.0. Hey there. Hey. Thanks. Thanks for that. Let's give you the big applause. <laughs> I, need to get, I need to get that for my show. I love that. <laughs> oh, Dave, thank you so much for being on the show. Really appreciate that. Um, You've got a very interesting story. You've been making the rounds all over the place. But I think, you know, for people that might not have followed you on other atheist shows, maybe you'd be so kind to give us a quick bio. Say, who Dave Warnock is? Yeah. Yeah. Nobody knew who I was until about three and a half years ago. Um, I got diagnosed with ALS. And shortly after that, I started, um, organically started this organization called Dying Out Loud, wherein I started um, going on a lot of podcasts and YouTube shows and traveling and speaking and just a lot of visibility in the atheist community. And um, that kind of uh, just grew and grew. I was an evangelical for a Christian, a charismatic evangelical for about three and a half decades. And many of those years I was on staff at churches as an associate pastor. So I was ordained and I could legally marry people and bury people and counseled them and all the things, did a lot of preaching and teaching, and um, then came to the end of my faith in early 2000s, uh, 2000, well, about 2011 and 12 is kind of when all that began to unravel, and I deconstructed and and uh, began to identify as an atheist, but for several years, I just kind of kept to myself and lived my life and enjoyed the freedom of uh, non-binary thinking and enjoyed the uh, liberty that comes with throwing off the cloak of, of uh, restrictive religion for years. And so, again, when I, when I got diagnosed with ALS, I began to talk about living and dying as an atheist. And that kind of led to where we are now. I've got uh, wrote my memoir. We're going to talk about that. I've got, a, I've got a YouTube show myself, that GD show that comes on every Monday night. And so it's just um, it's kind of been quite a wild ride, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, um, for, for those, I mean, everybody here is what, ALS is, but maybe you just want kind to of give us a quick explanation as to what kind of medical issue is that. Yeah, it's commonly known as Lou Gehrig's disease. A lot of people know know it as that. It's a uh, it's a terminal disease. It's it's a hundred percent fatal, just to be clear. And it's a motor neuron disease. So what that means is, essentially, the um, nerves quit communicating with the muscles. No one knows why. There's a lot of research that's been going on for years to try to identify the causes. And then if you can identify the causes, maybe find a cure. But to date, no one's been able to do that. So it's a very mysterious disease. It's a very rare disease. Um, I think maybe 5,000 people a year are diagnosed with it. Wow. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, the, nerves, the nerves quit communicating with the muscles. And so the muscles just quit working and they atrophy and you become paralyzed in different parts of your body, unable to use your arms and hands and legs eventually. Um, when you can't use your mouth and your diaphragm quits working and you essentially suffocate. So it's a very ugly disease with a very ugly ending. Um, mine started, my symptoms started in my fingers and hands and arms and pretty much stayed there for the first two or three years. The last year or so I've begun to have more difficulty walking where falls have begun to happen and things like that. But so far, the most important part of my body, my tongue, <laughs> is still working, and so I'm still able to talk, and so I do as much of that as possible. <laughs> That's what his wife said. His tongue is the important part of his body. Yeah, we'll just leave that alone. <laughs> hey, uh, Dave, you, you used to be an evangelical uh, before this, and you know, once you were diagnosed with ALS, was there a temptation to go back to the fold of Christianity? Yeah, I tried to get back in. I said, um, God, I was just kidding about that atheist stuff. Let's talk. And um, strangely enough, he didn't answer like he never did. So I, I gave up on that. No, 
Um, really, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. Once, once my faith unraveled and I came to the conclusion that nothing was there, no one had ever been there, all that I'd believed all those years was um, a, a, a false, a lie. Um, I'd given myself to something that wasn't true. Once I came to that conclusion, there was no going back. You can't unsee that. You can't unthink that. So getting diagnosed with ALS didn't move the needle at all on that. I just never had a, not for a nanosecond that I think, oh my, this is judgment from God, or this is God telling me I better get right with him. Um, no, it just, um, you know, it just, ALS, uh, things like this, a diagnosis like this make a whole lot more sense when there's no God. Mm. If I'd been diagnosed as a Christian, and I've been asked this several times, but if I'd been diagnosed as a Christian, then I would have had to factor God into it. In other words, where's God in this? You know, what's God saying? What's God doing? That was always the mental work that we did as Christians. Where's God in this? What's God saying? What's God doing? What's God's will? Is this right? Am I missing God? Is my hearing God or am I making it up? The It's exhausting in that evangelical mm -hmm. world to try to figure out what God's saying. And that in and of itself should give us pause. If there's a God there who wants to, above all things, communicate with his creation, why is it so fucking hard to hear him? Yeah, yeah. And yet right. it is. And, and, and everyone has difficulty with that. What's God's will? What's God saying? There have been multitudes of books written about it, and yet no one can definitively say, yes, this is it. This is what God's, because there's everybody disagrees. I mean, yeah. you've got the Calvinists disagreeing with the... Uh, free will people and and you've got 6000 protestant denominations all saying that they've got it right and the other ones have it wrong sorry mm -hmm. i'm venting. I, I went off track sorry yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely correct just just before this interview i was actually talking to a, a, a catholic podcaster and i was asking him the same question you know right. and he he says you know we we need to interpret according to the authority of the church and all that about why if you're a divine being why do your book needs an interpretation at all yeah Anybody should be able to read it in any language, and it should just magically it just make sense. Yeah, it'd be a lot more convincing if it was written in a language that we all somehow inherently knew. Yes, yes, you would actually have something there. You'd have like, oh, well, this well, is something more. Different. Yeah, for many years, the Catholics even prevented their parishioners from owning Bibles. They, they, uh, it was all in Latin, and so they would tell you what the Bible said. In fact, most Christians would never admit this. But the, your, your average run-of-the-mill Christian that goes to a, a, a mega church or a community church down the road or a little Baptist church, they're not living their lives according to what the Bible says. They're living their lives according to what the preacher says the Bible says. Yes. Mm. Everything is interpreted for them. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, I, I, I was maintain that the real Christians, I mean, they're not Christians, they're fans. They're, they're fans. Exactly. The real Christians, they're called monks. Because the message was, leave everything behind, sell everything you have, and follow me. That was the message. Mm -hmm. And the only ones that have actually done that, those are the monks. The one that actually did right. hold yeah. their life to, uh, to prayer and, and service to their, their, their God. So it's, it's an interesting thing. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> going back. So you decide to do uh, the, uh, a tour, a speaking tour, uh, calling Die Out Loud. And how was that received, essentially? Very surprisingly well, actually. I had a friend, um, Marie Le, LePage, who was an acquaintance of mine through an, a Facebook group that we had uh, from Commonalities, a, de a deconstruction group, essentially. And um, when she heard about my diagnosis and people were processing that, in Na I lived in Nashville at the time, um, and she just said, you know, she basically said, what do you want to do now? And I said, I don't know. What, what do you think? And she, I think she said, I think you ought to talk about stuff. You ought to talk about living and dying and you and um, facing a terminal illness as an atheist. And in contrast to my former view as a Christian, because those are two drastically different scenarios. You know, when you're looking at death as a Christian, you're, you're thinking, well, it's just a, a comma. And then you wake up in heaven. When you're looking at death as an atheist, you know, that it's the end. This is it. When I die, I go to sleep and don't wake up. And so. She said, I can, you know, let me re, let me kind of handle this as your manager and I reach out to 
podcasts and shows and stuff. So she started just reaching out and emailing people. And I started getting on this podcast and that podcast. And, and you know, nobody, at first nobody, nobody knew who I was. And, and I was just a name. And, you know, they, she told my story and they said, well, it's kind of an interesting story. Yeah, let's have him on. And so I'd get on one podcast and then someone would hear it and ask me on another. Then I, you know, get on the atheist experience with Matt Dillahunty. And then I get on Seth Andrews show and, and then uh, Dogma Debate with David Smalley and, and Bart Campolo and uh, Freedom for Religion with Dan Barker and mm-hmm. Daryl Ray. And I, do, and I know I'm name dropping, but when I started getting on these shows with these people that had fairly, fairly large followings, then people started hearing my story and relating with it. And I, and I started getting um, what was surprising to me, Kevin and, Kyle, you know a lot of it, this. You've kind of been, uh, I think you've been along for a big part of the ride. I know you've been, you know, we connected several years ago. But I just started getting these messages from people all over the world that could relate to what I was talking about. Because what I was really, when it, we called it dying out loud because that sounds more cool than living out loud. But, <laughs> and honestly, to this day, we don't remember who came up with the name. Uh, but it just really fit and sounded well but um it's a great name talking about death and talking about it out loud and and saying the quiet things out loud and and recognizing that this life is finite and brief and looking at it as a person who's got the clock ticking on the table uh it really helped people process what they were going through in this life um i started hearing from people that were facing illnesses and had depression and PTSD and cancer and uh, a lot of deconstructed Christian atheists who had a lot of trauma associated with that. And so I just started hearing from a lot of people that were gaining strength and inspiration from me talking about these things. And it really surprised me and encouraged me in, in terms of doing as much as I could with the time I had left and, and, that's kind of been what's it's kind of been what drives me and motivates me is knowing that that I'm reaching people, if you will. I hate to use that term because that's an old evangelical term, reach people for the gospel. But it's the truth. I was able to connect with people that I had never met and probably never will meet most of them. And it's been very rewarding to be able to use something that was really a shitty hand that was dealt to me but to be able to use it for things that are in many ways turning out to be really helpful for people. And then when I wrote my book and that started getting out, I've been in the last three or four months getting even more messages from people that just said, man, your book really helped me mm-hmm. to process my own journey. And so it's just been uh, way bigger and better than I could have imagined. I didn't really set out to do a big thing. I just thought, yeah, if I can talk on a few shows and travel and speak at different venues, then that'd be a cool thing. I'd love to do that. And yeah. it just turned it turned into a, a whole thing that I never saw coming, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. Um, Dave, you know, if there's one thing that we don't seem to be do, to do very well as atheists, as a community, it's facing death. We don't, we don't have great answers let's face it we have a lot of great answers for just about everything else but when it comes to the finality of life and death you know we we don't seem to we seem to drop the ball on that um how, how do you feel how, i'm not even sure what kind of question i want to ask here you, you think you think your experience you, you said it's helped other people but i mean yeah yeah, right. <laughs> well, I think I know what you're saying. You know, how do we face death? What's because uh, a lot of the questions I've been asked have they sound something like this? You know, are you afraid of death? Or what do you think? What do you think happens after we die? Um, those kind of questions. And honestly, the answer to the second one is I don't have a I don't have a clue what happens after we die. My uh, my feeling and my gut feeling is. My assessment is what I'm expecting is I will go to sleep and not wake up. Mm-hmm. And the, the, the part about that that I think we don't think through is that is nothing to be afraid of. Because the reality is, if that's true, 
when I go to sleep and I don't wake up, I won't be aware that I didn't wake up. Right. I, I won't be aware that I'm dead. I won't be sitting there. Oh my God, I didn't wake up. Now what am I going to do? That's not going to be happening. I'm just not going to be. It's going to be like before I was born. So that in and of itself is nothing to be afraid of. It's just what is. It's just, it's just something, you know, death is the natural result of living. It's something we're all going to encounter. The bigger question is, what are you doing with what you got? Because what we do know is that we have this one life. And uh, there's a quote that I use a lot now that's on one of our T-shirts in our merch store. That's actually become our favorite T-shirt. Um, it's, it, it was, it's the last line of a poem that someone sent me early on after my diagnosis. And the last line says this, we have two lives. And the second one begins when you realize you only have one. Yeah, that's a good one. Isn't that great? Yeah. So it's it's a very beautiful way to summarize the reality that we as atheists live with is that this is our one shot. This is not a dress rehearsal for the real show. This is not a preseason game. This is it. Now, what are you doing with it? What are you doing with this time? Are you making the most of it? Are you writing the story you want to write? And if you're not, why not? Whose fault is that? Who's that on? And so that's a lot of what I talk about. And that has to do with living out loud. Are you living the life you want to live? If you're not, whose fault is that? Who's going to change that? As evangelical Christians, and a lot of my audience is that, is that people that have come from that world that I was in, you don't have your own autonomy as an evangelical Christian. Your goal is to live according to the will of God, and you're subject to spiritual leaders and spiritual authorities. So you really aren't someone who can get up every day and say, what is the life I want to live? Who am I? What do, who do I want to be? You're all told, you're told who that is. Everyone else is telling you what to do and how to live. So you don't get to be your own person. But when you throw those shackles off and you realize you're a free moral agent and you get to decide what life you want to live, Oftentimes, we don't know how to do that. We haven't been given the tools to do that. So I guess what people have resonated with is when I talk about that out loud and I say, live the life you want to live, write your own story. And they've seen me do it. They've seen me change my life going from, and it cost me a lot to, to become an evangel. I mean, to come out of evangelicalism and become an atheist. I lost a lot of my family. I lost friends. I lost relationships i lost identity i lost all the stuff that a lot of us have experienced and but you can recreate yourself and become a different person and become the person you want to be and write the story you want to write and so that's a lot of what i talk about and then and then adding death to that is just i, I guess just talking out loud about it saying that yes i see the end for me is nearer than I thought it was going to be and nearer than most of you are probably going to deal with. And it doesn't matter. I'm still going to make, I'm still going to get up every day and make the most of the moments that I have and do the most that I can with the life I have. And uh, that's, that's uh, encouraged a lot of people and that, and that's really been gratifying to me. So the death part is just, it's just saying the quiet things out loud again and letting people off the hook from having to worry about what that means or what it doesn't mean and just put it, put that on the back burner and live the life you want to live because you're going to die and, and it's okay. <laughs> that's, the, that's the bottom line. You're going to die and it's okay. I like that a lot. Yeah. So, well, I mean, uh, when you think about it, each one of us kind of dies every night. Because there's a point, you know, where you, you slumber, you're asleep, and, you know, you're not aware of anything. Right. Except your dreams. And, you don't, and those don't make sense, so you can't really factor those in. <laughs> Every yeah. night we get a free trial. Yeah, that's yeah. yeah, right. You get a free trial. What's, what's that going to be like? And, and part of the thing is, too, again, as ex-Christians, we've, you know, death is the enemy. In the Christian world, death is the enemy. In fact, the Bible even says the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And, and the Christian world, it views, it, it views death as a bad thing. And so we have this fear of death. That's In fact, in my conversations since my diagnosis, 
the Christians have the harder time with death than the atheists do. And because you've been told it's a bad, bad thing and Jesus conquered it. And so when you look at death as an enemy and as a bad thing, then of course you're going to be afraid of it and you're going to be weirded out by it. But when you embrace it, it's just the natural result of living in a normal part of our human experience, then it's not a bad thing. And that's that's why it's it's good to remind ourselves, you know what, I'm going to die and it's, it's okay. Oh, you will. I mean, I've got the mothership coming back to get me, so. <laughs> yeah, well, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dave, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, one of the main reasons I latched on to you in the first place and have followed you since is because of what you just said. You, I myself had a, an enormous fear of death. I mean, we talked about that. Uh, right, mm-hmm. right. And uh, I've gotten better. I have been able to accept my mortality in its entirety and i no longer well occasionally suffer the the occasional nightmare but yeah yeah it, it is not nearly as frequent and being able to help moderate your show i get to to hear about it every single week so it's it's been if you'll excuse the term a blessing a sec- secular blessing <laughs> It's okay. So. We we can we can take that word away from them every now and then. <laughs> I, I like to use the philosophy of Woody Allen. He says, I'm not afraid of death. I just don't want to be there when it happens. That's <laughs> kind of how it is. Yeah. And you there. And the point is, you won't be. That's no, the point. That's the right. beautiful point. You know, uh, when you when you think of uh, atheism and death, um, I can't help but go to the late great Christopher Hitchens who, um, in some aspect, pretty much do- almost documented his death with his last book, right? Yeah. Which he didn't really finish. Um, is that something that you kind of plan on doing as well, or do you plan on continuing writing your books and your experience and how your disease is, for lack of a better term, progressing? Yeah, well, I wrote the memoir, Childish Things, as just to kind of um, kind of – cathartic for myself and and to kind of get down my story on paper and i'm really glad i did and i'm really glad with how it came out and then my plan is to write a second book and probably a final book um just called dying out loud and and that will be uh essentially um the amalgamation of the events that have occurred in the past three and a half years not so much a sequel or a part two memoir but more of a of a a just a collection of the conversations I've had, the places I've gone, the people I've talked to, the messages I've gotten, the um, lessons I've learned, if you will, the, the, the things that have come out of this that have resonated with people, like that quote that I just shared with you, that, that have kind of crystallized the essence of what it is I've been talking about for three and a half years now. And so in that, but along with that, the Dying Out Loud book will also be a bit more of a, of a chronicling of what the ALS disease is doing to me. Because I really didn't, the book kind of ended with, with the diagnosis, spoiler alert, um, and my processing of it, and then the launching of the Dying Out Loud. So it kind of set the stage for uh, the sequel, if you will, but not looking at it as a sequel, but more of a chronicling of of what are my thoughts and feelings as this thing unfolds and as I digress and as I get closer to the end. Now, I don't know. My goal is to have it out and to to actually write it and release it in 2023. Um, And I think I've got a a good chance to do that. Um, Once I, I've got a pretty heavy uh, travel schedule coming up in the next two to three months july august september but then after that it slows down a bit and i think then i can i can start hammering out the document the uh, manuscript for that for that second book in in that sense covid was a blessing because (laughs) i was traveling my ass off prior to covid and then everything got canceled and it forced me to sit down and because i couldn't do anything couldn't go anywhere i really had to i mean i I said okay because i've been toying with the book for a couple of years and then with COVID, I just ran out of excuses to not write. And I really got disciplined and, and sat down and wrote every single day for a good year and, and got the book hammered out. So that was 
that was God's way of making me get this book written is to give the whole world uh, a, 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 virus. a fatal, a fatal <laughs> virus. And, and just so that I could write my book now, as outrageous as that sounds coming out of my mouth, many Christians think that way. Yes. yes. That, that God sent this hurricane just to test my faith. And look, my house was destroyed, but my Bible wasn't touched. You know, you've seen those things. And my God, how do you, what, uh, what kind of a mind do you have to have to think that way? Yeah, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty mind blowing already. Right? <laughs> my favorite ones are when uh, there's a fire and the Bible's not destroyed. Like, do you know how paper burns, right? Right. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! You could throw that Bible into a, a a bonfire and it wouldn't burn. Not immediately. It would take a lot of time and a lot of heat. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, speaking of your book, Dave, I mean, now your book is out there, and uh, we'll, we'll tell people in a few minutes how to get that book. Obviously, um, how has it been received so far? You know what? Uh, I was again. I don't want to sound like I'm. Pr- pr- pumping myself up here, but oh, I, I, oh, please do, please do. I was I was genuinely shocked at how well it's been received. I sent it out to several people who become friends that I wanted to write that want asked that I asked them to write a, a blurb for it, you know. And um, like for instance, Daryl Ray was one of them, the rec- uh, recovering from religion founder, and he's become a good friend. Well, and and um, I sent it to him, and and I knew that you know Daryl was somebody that wouldn't. He wouldn't blow smoke up my ass. He would tell me the truth. You know, if it was like, ah, Dave, you know, it wasn't bad, but, you know, keep your day job or whatever. (laughs) And uh, so I sent him the manuscript and I kind of held my breath for about a, I thought, you know, a few few days. And he read it really quick and he called me and he just said, are you ready for a call from a fanboy? I said, what do you mean? (laughs) Dave, your book is fantastic. I wouldn't say that. Uh, he said, I get, a, I get sent a lot of books and I, I don't think I've seen one this well written. It's just incredible. Well done. You know, he was just, if, just effusive in his praise. And, um, and so, yeah, I started getting that kind of feedback and I thought, wow, we've really, and I had a co-writer, a friend of mine, who's a, an English uh, teacher and creative writing teacher at a, at a uh, professor at a college. So she really helped me craft it in a way that was not just me telling my story, but made it kind of come alive mm. and made it kind of made it read like a novel. And over and over again, I've heard from people that said I, I couldn't put it down. You know, I, I listened to the audiobook straight through without stopping, you know, uh, just that kind of feedback was just really gratifying. And so, yeah, it came out better than I really could have dreamed. And uh, I feel like I really told my story in a way that was relatable in a way that was, um, help people really feel not only what I went through, but what they've gone through mm. and helped them give a uh, definition to their own story and help them understand their own story better. And I really couldn't ask for anything more than that. That's really been a huge, again, blessing um, <laughs> to, uh, to, to get that kind of feedback. And just even today, I had two more messages from people that just finished the book and told me, how much it helped them process their own deconstruction and how much it helped them understand. And even people who, who hadn't lived through all of that. I, I was on a show with no illusions, the uh, scathing atheist the other day hmm. and, and he had read it and he didn't, he didn't live through that, but he said, it helped me understand how someone could get drawn into that and live in that and, and be sucked into it and believe something at, that outrageous for that long. Mm-hmm. He's, he said, you really, you really made it relatable to almost anyone to, to understand how someone can get caught up in that. And so that helped me, you know, to see that even people who didn't go through that kind of deconstruction could understand what it was like for those who did. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's pretty intense. Yeah, and it's high praise from Daryl Ray because I love Daryl Ray. He's, he's a great, praise. he's a great guy. The high priest of the uh, fly, church of the flying thing anymore. <laughs> yes, we should all give reverence to him. Yeah, I, I, I love Daryl because I remember he coming to me one time and said, he says, Kevin, you know what's the definition of a pervert? I said, no, Daryl, what is it? I said, it's somebody who has better sex than you. <laughs> I said, Daryl. <laughs> that's Daryl. 
That's perfect. <laughs> That's just so perfect. <laughs> so, Dave, I mean, I, I got to ask you, right? I mean, somebody gets diagnosed with ALS, and it's a terminal disease. And, you know, I think a lot of us will just give up, you know, sign off. But you, you didn't do that. You just decided to document and relate your experience and almost make a whole new thing out of it. What drives you to do that? Man, I don't know. I, I just, I just, I, I, I just, I'm not, I guess I'm not wired to just roll over. Um, I've always been kind of, I've always felt like an underdog and kind of had to make my own way and, and not accept the status quo. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, honestly, I thought, originally I thought that I would just travel as, because when you get diagnosed with ALS, the, you know, you're told the prognosis is three to five years of, of life. So you, you know, the idea is you could be dead in a year or two. You could be dead in three years. You could, you know, be in a wheelchair in six months. You could be unable to talk in a year. Mm -hmm. And I met, I've met a lot of ALS people that have experienced that. It, they, it's gone a lot quicker than that they thought. And, um, or, you know, it can go quicker than, than you think. So I just, uh, I, I just thought, well, I've got limited time. I'm going to travel and do as much as I can as, as long as I can. And then when I can't do it anymore, I'm, I'll hang it up. Mm -hmm. And then I got challenged by Marie and the dying out loud stuff started. And I thought, you know, as long as I can contribute something, I want to make sure that I've got, um, that I'm able to do that. And so, uh, I did. I just kind of dug in and, and started doing this. And honestly, if I didn't have this kind of work to um, to motivate me to get up, to get me going, you know, it's, it's what I do every day. It's, it gets me up every day. I get up energized to do the work I do, to plan for my show, to talk to people about speaking engagements, to correspond with people who've ordered my book. These, these things are just, um, it's kind of my job, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so if I didn't have that, I realized I'd just be monitoring my progression and waiting to die. And, and that's just not appealing to me. No, no. It's, even, even talking about it sometimes feels a bit awkward, right? I mean, it's, it's a topic that we're, nobody's very com comfortable with. No, but not at all. Do you, do you plan when the, the time gets closer? Do you plan on using, I don't know, uh, you said you're in Nashville or so in Tennessee. I'm glad they have the kind of programs in Tennessee, but, you know, the kind of uh, dying with dignity, assisted uh, uh, assisted death. Do you have anything like that? Well, I've, I've talked with groups that work with that. There's a final exit network I work with that help people end things on their own terms. I'm actually living in North Carolina now with Bevan, my partner. That's not your fault. That's okay. And North Carolina, I mean, but Nashville, Tennessee is where, where I'm from. Neither of those states have death, death with dignity laws, and most states mm -hmm. don't. Most states don't. But even those laws are so restrictive that I probably wouldn't use them in, in terms of you have to have a diagnosis from two doctors that you're going to be dead within six months, and then you can get the medicine or whatever. Well, with ALS, that's not really something that I would be interested in going that far. Um mm -hmm. So I, I do intend to, you know, I don't know where the line is that I'll draw, but when it gets to where the losses outweigh the wins on a daily basis and it's become too difficult for people to take care of me and to do the things that I need to do every day just to exist, I'm not interested in the length of days I live. I'm interested in the quality of the days I live. So that's, that's really where I'm measuring things, and I don't know when that'll be. And I don't have to know. I just know that I, I have the freedom, regardless of what anybody tells me. It's my life, and I will be the one who decides how and when and, and what and where. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't think that we die well in this country. I've talked about that a lot. I think we force people to stay alive longer than they want to or than, that anyone wants to. It's just that, and I think the reasons for that are, are undergirded by our religi religious ideologies. Um, things like you can't, you can't, you can't play God and that all those bullshit statements. I just don't buy into any of that. Mm -hmm. So, no, I, I'm up here in Canada, and in Canada we do have those laws that. Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, one of the uh, co-hosts on the show, uh, Nancy, has passed away a couple of years ago. Oh wow! She, she went out. She was 83, and she had lung cancer. 
So and she was she went out on her own terms essentially like that. So uh, yeah, hopefully 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 somewhere down the road you'll have that option to you as well. Open to you. Well, I intend to. I don't know what that'll look like, but you know when the time comes, I'll know it. And um, I don't want you know it's not just what I want, but or what's best for me. I I have to consider Bevan, my partner, who takes care of me and people around me in my life. You know. It, at some point this disease gets to where everyone has to, someone has to do everything for you. Yeah. And, and just existing is a really, really bur is a real burden. You know, I don't want to take, I don't want to take away from any quality of life that we would enjoy, but when the, when the quality of life is just not there and everything's difficult, everything's a burden. Um, you know, why are you still, why are you still fighting this fight? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, that's, that's a tough goal, man. I know it's tough stuff. It's tough stuff, but it's it's uh, it's it's useful stuff nonetheless because it, this is a diagnosis. Although you fail five thousand people a year get diagnosed, that's, right? You could replace ALS with just about any other ailment out there, and it's almost the same thing. Yeah, it's not just this; it's a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. So, hmm. so I guess. W w What's oh, we've talked about it briefly already, but what's coming up for you? Uh, you, you talked about writing a couple other books. Is there anything else, other projects that you have coming down the pipe? There? Well, I do, uh, I do a lot of traveling and speaking. I, um, conferences that I've got coming up. I, I just I spoke at the atheist American Atheist Conference a month or so ago. I've got a conference in Fort Wayne, Indiana, in a couple of weeks. I've got another one in Nashville at the end of July, and then one in Canada in August, and then some separate individual groups bringing me in so I'm, i do a lot of that coming up this summer and fall um i've got my my weekly show that gd show you can see the logo in the background there a guy made a sign for me so we <laughs> do that every every monday night that's a live show and we, we really put a lot of work into that we have really interesting guests we talk about important topics it's a live show we take calls from viewers and things like that so you know just this uh just Continuing to do that, those kind of things and that kind of work as long as I can. And, and like I said, then working on the book in the in between all that. Yeah, I got to say, uh, I'm very excited personally to uh, meet you in Fort Wayne. And in just a oh, you're weeks. coming. That's right. That's right. Yep. I will be there with my girlfriend, Haley. Awesome, dude. Yeah. Uh, when you, you said you're traveling to Canada. Where about in Canada are you traveling? That not 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 out west. It, actually, it's uh, Ontario, uh, Sarnia, Ontario. It's okay. a, uh, yeah, ah. it's just across the border from Detroit. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, not too bad, not too shabby. Um, they, was there? You know, I you said there was a lot of positive feedback. Was there also pushback when you when you wrote your book? With, with the book? Yeah. Well, surprisingly, not yet. Um, I I don't know if there's, I mean, I, I don't know who's reading it. Like I sent it to my mom and my mom's a little evangelical Christian lady that loves Jesus and can't wait to go to heaven. And, um, <laughs> you know, she's very upset about my atheism. Um, so I, I, she hasn't responded either way and negatively or positively. So I don't know what she thinks, but uh, others who've read it, um, Okay, I'm sorry. I'm just getting an important message. I'm on the atheist experience in a little bit. I'm getting some oh, messages. Yeah, that's from. Clear. I mean, from, we're like bottom of the barrel. Atheist experience. No, I just, I, I just, I'm, I'm, Matt's calling me, and I'm thinking, oh shit, what's going on? Oh. But I'll call him when we get. He just said call when he's done. So anyway, sorry. I just, I, I did. Anyway, um, I haven't gotten any negative feedback in terms of you know. Uh, you're full of shit and you, you're a liar or any of that. I kind of thought I would. I keep waiting for that Amazon review. That's really tearing me apart. <laughs> and so every time when I look on there, it's just all glowing reviews. And I'm thinking, well, either there's not any bad ones or they're not saying it. So, yeah. but you know what? I, I, I didn't treat anyone in the book unkindly. Um, I told the truth. And uh, my co-writer said the first rule in memoir writing is tell the fucking truth. And so I, uh, any, even the characters that, that were portrayed unflatteringly, um, I was kind with them and generous. And in fact, I've been told multiple times that of all the characters in the book that you treated the most unkindly, it was yourself. Mm. 
that I was hardest on myself. I threw myself under the bus multiple times, but I was just honest. I was just honest about my own misgiving, my, my own failures, my own um, uh, faults, um, and and anybody else that I would put that came out looking like um, they weren't good people or didn't behave well. I didn't, I wasn't bashing them. I was just, you know, cause I, I was trying to, because I really felt this way and do feel this way that even the people in the book that were portrayed negatively, um, they weren't trying to do bad things. They were just misguided themselves or um, in, in, you know, whatever you want to call it. It's not like there were bad people doing bad things. Well, there was one, ex-pastor boss of mine that maybe it's just a bad, bad person, but <laughs> yeah, <everybody. laughs> yeah. So uh, I maybe wasn't as good to him as, as anybody else, but he really is a piece of shit, but, <laughs> uh, but no, I just was honest and I didn't, I don't, I don't, and I do have this general, this general rule of living essentially is that most people in fact, almost all people, unless you're a sociopath or a psychopath, get up every day and do the best they can. Yeah. Just trying to get through their day, just trying to live their life, just trying to make the best decisions they can. They're not getting up every day thinking, wow, who can I really fuck with today? Who can I mess? Who can I just step on today? Mm -hmm. Most people aren't doing that. Yeah. Now, if they do hurt people or they do make bad choices like I did, like we all do, it's because they're usually responding to their own hurt mm -hmm. or they're usually confused about something or deceived about something. And they're going about things in ways that aren't helping people or, but are hurting them. And so that's kind of a rule of, of things. It's kind of a rule I live by. And I think it for the most part serves me well. Mm -hmm. And so as I was writing the book and talking about the events in my life and the characters that flowed in and out of my life, um, that's how I treated them, you know, that they're not bad people, that even if they did things that did that hurt people, whether it's me doing something that hurts someone or someone doing something that hurts me, no one's doing it intentionally. Mm -hmm. We're all just doing the best we can. Yeah, I believe it was Gene Simmons that says, uh, people will hurt you. You just have to decide that they're worth suffering for. Yeah. <laughs> Dave, one last thing i got to ask you, is, before I ask you where to find your book, because we got to get back pin down to um, any piece of advice you have for anybody out there that might be going through something similar to you what, what's your advice for reaching through the ether out there people that you know they have some tragedies in their future what, what piece of advice would Dave want to give them well I guess to summarize the things we've already talked about um, you have one life and if you get if you get dealt a difficult hand, if you get a, if you wake up tomorrow and you've been in an accident and you're uh, paralyzed, or if you get a bad diagnosis or someone you love is taken from you or any number of things that can happen to us in this chaotic life that we live, you have to decide how you're going to react to that. And you have to choose what you're going to do with that. And not everyone can, not everyone can react the same way and not everyone can um, handle things the same. I'm not saying that you have to do it like I do it. Um, I'm just, I'm just living my life the best I can. I've just chosen to respond to this in the best way that I can without, um, without any kind of really plan. I've just said, you know what? I don't know how long I have, but I'm going to use the days I have the best I can. And that's all any of us can do. And really, whether you whether you get a diagnosis like mine or not, all of us have limited number of days. Mm -hmm. And we have to choose what am I going to do with those days? How do I want to live the life I have? That's really it. It sounds really simple. And on its surface, it is really simple, but it's not always easy to do mm -hmm. because life is hard and there's bills to pay and there's deadlines, there's commitments, there's there's stress. There's people in our lives that cause anxiety and stress. I know all those things. And then many of us deal with mental illnesses that we didn't choose or 
uh, issues that we didn't, that we were born with that we have no control over. And I'm not, you know, I'm not mitigating any of those things, but I'm just saying that we all have to do the best we can with what we have every single day. And if we get up, if we get up and, and just do that, then I'm thinking, I think that for the most part, uh, it'll, it'll be, there'll be a good result. Mm -hmm. Dave, thank you so much for coming on the show. If people want to find out more about your books and your adventures, be shameless, my friend. Point yourself in. Where can they find you? Well, my website is DaveOutloud.org. So uh, we couldn't get Dying Out Loud, but Dave Out Loud works just as well because I'm loud. Um, <laughs> DaveOutloud.org. You'll find links to all my platforms, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, whatever. The book is available on Audible, and um, I did read the audiobook myself. So you have 12 and a half hours of this annoying southern accent um oh it's beautiful yeah uh thanks kyle you're very kind um <laughs> it's available on amazon in paperback and ebook format if you do want a hardcover the amazon didn't link well we we didn't want to do the amazon hardcover because that's kind of cheap we did a really nice hardcover with a dust jacket and a really well done hardcover in fact i'm really proud of the the uh i'm gonna try to hold it up the cover my hands don't work very well. The cover, nice. Childish Things, um, done by a really good friend of mine. He's become a good friend of mine. He reached out after seeing me on some shows. He lives in Nashville. Cairo Wolf, shout out to my brother. He did the, uh, he did the uh, graphic design on the book cover. Um, the picture is actually a picture of me and my mom, um, circa 1958. And the wow. cover, the title, Childish Thing, is taken from a scripture in 1 Corinthians 13, mm. um, which essentially says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood and thought like a child. But when it became a man, I put away childish things. Yeah. So that's essentially me saying that um, waking up from the fog of evangelical Christianity was me putting away childish things. A little bit of a backhanded slap at Christianity, but there it is. One well deserved. Thank so, you. so the hardcover, I was going to finish. Uh, the hardcover is available. If you want a signed hardcover or paperback, you can write, email me at daveoutloud, daveoutloud at gmail.com, which the email is also on the website. And you can also get a hardcover that way. So those are the ways you can get it. Um, I think you'll like it. I, I, um, been, like I said, I've been very pleased with the book. I appreciate uh, that a little answer. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Dave, thank you so much for being on the show. Really appreciate that. But before I let you go, I gotta have you say hi. This is Dave Warnock, and I took a left at the valley. Hi, this is Dave Warnock, and I took a left at the valley. Fantastic. 